the onboard one. Oh. Should I read it for you? No. <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome aboard our home, MV Freedom. I'm Sean. And I'm Elizabeth. And MV Freedom is our home and she is a 2004 Nordhaven 43 foot trawler. If you're new to our channel, welcome. If you're not new to our channel, thanks for coming back. We've been wanting to do this video for a while now. Um, we've been living aboard the boat for a little over eight months now. Um, and we thought after a few months we would check back in and let you guys know how it's going, what we like about it, if we regret it. So now we're finally getting around to just having some straight talk with you guys about what the good, the not so good is about living aboard, um, some advice we have to you, and answer some of your questions that have to do with this very topic, living on a boat. This was, I think, step number four in a five-step process to set out on some big cruising plans of ours. So the first step was sell our old boat, which was a 2007 40-foot Sea Ray. Next was sell our condo so that we could buy a boat. Third was find our trawler and buy a trawler, uh, preferably a Nordhaven. And the fourth step of our plan was to then move aboard and live full time um, while still saving money for our long range cruising plans. And then step five, which we're about one to two years away from, is leaving all of it behind and setting off on a full time cruising plan to um, maybe go around the world or as far as we can, as safely as we can um, with our dog, Sully. So this was step four in a five step process to get us ready to do a lot of really exciting cruising in the coming years. Oh yeah, <laughs> and when, March of 2020 is when we finally pulled the trigger and um, we were fortunate enough to get a live aboard slip. We had been on several waiting lists for six years um, and luckily um, this came about. So we live at Shoal Shoal Bay Marina here in Seattle. we love about it. I think easily the number one thing I love is that it's the best, most affordable waterfront property you can ever have. And at least for us, it's going to be the most affordable waterfront property we'll ever own. So that would be the probably the best thing in my opinion. And what I like about it is we can take that waterfront property and we can just move it. If we want new scenery or want to check out a new destination, we can plot a course, fire up the engine, and move our home. Go. Also, living more simply with less has been huge. Just that minimalistic lifestyle. Um, we don't have a storage unit, and when we, over the last five or six years, we've been downsizing um, to a studio apartment, which was our last home, and shedding away all the stuff that we had over the five years that we were um, really planning for this. Um, it's just a great feeling to not have a lot of extra, you know, excess in your life that you don't use or you don't need. Um, once you get rid of it, you free up like mental space, you just feel happier and lighter and knowing that everything we have is right here is a pretty awesome feeling. I like being able to get away from the masses. Um, obviously we can move our boat wherever we want, but often that's uh, moving our boat away from sort of civilization and being out at anchor, being out in nature and being out where a lot of people, um, you know, aren't as fortunate to have the opportunity to, to go and, and ha have that type of experience. So I like being able to get away from the masses and this year it's been especially helpful given the pandemic situation and, and social distancing. There's not a better way to socially distance than getting on a boat and going to a private anchorage. Yep, and I think also um, you know, being able to get away from the masses, just being so close to nature and to wildlife. Um, just here at our marina, we have seals that swim by all day long. We have sea lions that hang out on the dock. So instead of having 
neighbors in an apartment building that you see in the elevator, when we go walk down the dock, we usually see wildlife. We see birds, we see the sea lions, and it's just awesome to be around nature. So if, if you're an outdoors person and being in nature and being around water makes you happy, which is what makes us happy, um, you'll find this lifestyle to be a very happy lifestyle. Okay, so there's lots that we love about living on our boat. What do we not so love about living on our boat? I think the biggest thing for us is getting access to reliable high-speed internet. Um, being on a boat that's much more difficult than at home. Some of the marinas offer uh, Wi-Fi service, but as you can imagine, there's many users trying to use the same service, so um, it's, it's not very high speed and it's definitely not reliable. So, and, and a lot of times we're traveling, so a Wi-Fi connection isn't going to um, take care of us when we're not at the marina. So for us, internet comes in the way of many uh, cellular accounts. It's phones, it's hotspots, and it's us sort of juggling between all of our various accounts trying to get decent enough um, internet or data to be able to work full time and, and do what we need to do. Yeah, and it's, uh, you think it would be easier, um, but it's not, and it's, it's honestly terrible. Um, it's our biggest struggle living on the boat. If I was still working in my corporate job, I don't think this would be possible, especially now with COVID and a lot of stuff shut down. So in the past, I could go work at a Starbucks if I wanted to, or work at a coffee shop, and now there's so much that doesn't allow you to sit in the store. Um, so I don't think the two of us right now could actually work two full-time traditional jobs. Um, so if anybody out there has any connections to Starlink or uh, any other great services, you just... <laughs> so some of the other things that, you know, aren't horrible, but you know, we, it's a noticeable difference from living on land is things aren't as easy to access, obviously, as living on land. So we do have a car that we leave at the marina. Um, it's an old car. We're keeping it until we um, cast off for the final time. And when we're at the marina that we live at, it's easy because we can just quickly go to the grocery store. But we travel a ton and we're at anchor a lot. So if we need groceries, everything is just a little harder. Um, if we need to go into town for something, we have to plan our travels around where we think there's going to be access to a grocery store. Or if we need parts for the boat, we have to plan around that. Here at Shul Shul, we have a great mail system. It's um, Dockside Mail. They manage all of our mail for us, and they will continue to manage our mail for us even when we're not cruising in this area. Um, they manage mail for people all around the world through a scanning system, which will be great. Um, but when you need packages like Amazon stuff, boat parts, um, anything like that, you do have to plan to make sure you're somewhere um, that has a post office or um, a carrier service that will deliver to where you are. So little things that you don't, you, you, we totally take for granted on land are just a little more difficult. Along those lines, utilities are certainly not as convenient as, as your house, and that comes in the way of power, water, and sewage. A boat, for example, for the sewage, it goes into a tank, and then you have to deal with having that periodically pumped, either a service coming to your boat or you taking your boat to a dock to have that removed. Same with water. Water gets stored in the tank, and then there's pumps to pressurize it and run it through the boat. Uh, so you got to keep an eye on your tank levels and refill the tanks as they get low and the power as well um, you know there's a limited amount of power that comes through a shore power cable and you need to at times sort of manage that power it's definitely not uh, I guess as easy as a house where you can hop in the shower and take a two-hour long shower if you want and not think about or worry about where that water is going to or where it's coming from um, so that that part's just a little bit different than living in a home yeah, and if you're like me and you have no idea what an amp is or, you know, all the stuff that has to do with our power system and our inverter, you'll get to know it really quickly and you'll be smarter for it and it becomes kind of fun. Um, although, like, yeah, every little thing is a little more work and a little more thought. Um, also, every couple years, or every one to two years, our home has to come out of the water. So we have to have hull work done, um, any other maintenance of things that we can't do while the boat's in the water that we can't dive and do. We have to do while the boat's on the hard. So we were just talking about that recently that we have some hull work to do this spring and we were both reminded that, oh yeah, we have to pull the boat and where are we gonna go? Um, we probably could live aboard the boat while it's out of the water, um, especially if we could do the work within a week or two. Um, but if it gets any longer than that, we'll have to stay at a hotel and figure something out. So 
you know, stuff like that that can be a little bit of a pain every one to two years. Yeah. And then I guess lastly, um, by comparison of living in an apartment, it's never ending work. Um, you know, boats are a lot of maintenance. It doesn't matter what kind of boat you have. Um, and it certainly probably gets worse with uh, the age of your boat, how old it is. But, you know, all of the systems need, uh, you know, upkeep. A boat is in a saltwater environment. Um, it's like it's like taking your house and putting it in salt water and then having your house be movable. So shaking it and vibrating <laughs> it and moving it all around. You know, there's things that are going to break and there's things that, that need maintenance. And a boat is certainly something that needs constant maintenance. Mm -hmm. Some of it um, can be enjoyable but it also is a lot of work, so need to be prepared for that. So we talk about this all the time, and for the longest time, I honestly said I don't miss one thing about land life. We've always been tiny home people. We've always spent or wanted to spend the majority of our time on our boats. So for the longest time, I didn't miss anything until I saw a video um, somewhat recently by Boating Journey, who's also a local Seattle couple, um, that's looking for their live aboard home here in Seattle and they recently did an interview with Jeff aboard MV Why Not and he has a 30 30 some foot Nordic yeah, Nordic, Nordic tug, tug. Um, and they did an interview with him where they asked him the same question like what do you miss about living on land and he said a sectional couch and when I heard that I was like that's it that's exactly what I miss I miss big comfy couches um, you know this boat's super comfortable and we have um, a pilot house couch or settee. We have a settee on the port side. We have this L shape right here that we're sitting on, but nothing is long enough or quite as comfortable as a nice big cushy sectional couch. So that's all I miss, having sectional couches. For me, it's probably, um, I don't know, the one thing that, that men like is having like a workspace whether it's a basement or it's a garage a place to do projects a place to have all your tools and spread them all out those are um, that's probably what I would would miss the most uh, Nordhaven does have a lot of places for me to stash my tools and the engine room's pretty big but sometimes for big projects it's nice to just like have a workbench be able to sprawl out and that'd probably be what I miss most about uh, living on land I think a man cave having a man cave. <laughs> My only regret is not doing it sooner. How yeah, about you? Same thing. No regrets. We truly love living on our boat. We know it's not for everybody and we get so many emails from people that have never even owned a boat that have a dream of living on a boat and that I would say might be a little scary if you've never even been on a boat or had your own boat. Um, don't just jump into this. Um, especially if uh, maybe you have a partner or a spouse, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, who might not be on board. This is a pretty big leap. Um, we've had 16 years of kind of getting to this point, but no regrets. Yeah, I wish we would have done it sooner. We've mentioned this before. We did have some reservations like before we moved aboard. Um, when we knew we had the slip, we did have a little moment of like, do we really want to move aboard the boat? Um, so yeah, I'm so glad we jumped in and did it. If we we're planning to be in Seattle for the rest of our lives and didn't have the cruising plans that we have, would we still want to live on a boat? I definitely would. I would too. We spent every um, you know, minute when we were living in our land-based home thinking about and planning our next boat trip and wanting to be on the boat. Sundays were always depressing when we had to close up the, you know, the boat and go back to our apartment or condo and get ready for the the work week right now it's nice to just know you don't have to go anywhere this is this is your home yeah so i really enjoy that aspect of it i whether or not we were planning to you know go cruising full time or just stay stationary in one region of the world i think it's pretty awesome living on the water living on a boat yeah and at shulshul where we are about 30 percent of the marina are liveaboards and a lot of the boats here where the people live aboard their boat they actually don't even move it that often if ever we've met some people that never take their boat out they just love the waterfront property aspect of it they love the marina setting and they just love their boat so you don't necessarily need to cruise anywhere to live on your boat you can still enjoy all of it and stay in your slip and even last night we were grilling out back and it was so beautiful and calm and we were just commenting about how there's so there's million dollar homes right up the hill that are not nearly as close to the water as we are, and we have this awesome 
you know, waterfront view and we wouldn't trade it for a thing. But also don't be uh, mistaken, I don't think it's necessarily a less expensive lifestyle. You know, slip fees are expensive and all of the maintenance that comes with a boat. So for people thinking that they want to jump out and, you know, maybe it's not the boating that they're interested in, but they think it's a, you know, a cheap way of life. Um, I, I think that that's probably far from the truth and we'll just caution you to fully understand what the costs are before you jump into it and don't do it for those reasons. Yeah. We get so many emails from a lot of people that are considering this change of lifestyle and by far my number one piece of advice is to downsize, downsize, downsize and get yourself into a mode of minimalism um, and do it over time. Don't try to do it like a month before you pull the trigger. We spent the last five years downsizing in anticipation of this because we knew this was um, a, a goal of ours. Um, but it's hard when you go from 1,500 square feet to 800 square feet to 700 square feet to 515 square feet, which was our last studio. Each move, we got rid of so much stuff and we were shocked at how much stuff we still had and how many trips to Goodwill we still had to do. So if we had to do all of that, you know, right before moving aboard this boat, it would have been a huge burden, like just emotional burden. So start downsizing, start just getting real with what you absolutely need and don't bring it onto your boat. Don't bring all that excess stuff onto your boat because boats are small to begin with and you don't want all of that clutter cluttering up your boating life. So downsize, downsize, downsize. Can't say that enough. Yeah, as Elizabeth said, our, our last studio is 515 square feet and our boat is 400 square feet. So, you know, it was a pretty easy transition. If you're coming from a, you know, 2,500 square foot home and then you're trying to squeeze down to 400 square feet, it's gonna be much more difficult. Um, the next thing I would suggest is if you're not handy, become handy. You can certainly, you know, try to find people to do the work for you and you can pay for the different services, but, you know, half of that struggle is just finding people's availability and it's nice to be able to be self-sufficient when you're out cruising and be able to take care a lot of the work uh, yourself so if you're not handy become handy yeah and cost yeah and you save yourself a ton of cost by being able to do it yourself tens of thousands of dollars potentially sean suffers from an ailment called i have to do everything right now and it had to it all has to be done yesterday and it gets kind of stressful some days where he's trying to pack in so much and you know when you go down a rabbit hole of one project it leads to another project and it can add a lot of um, unnecessary stress so be handy know that it's going to be a lot of work but take it in stride you know you have time don't try to get everything done and, and fixed or upgraded yesterday and then uh, when you are when you've made the decision and you want to move aboard a boat um, you know, really consider the layout as you're looking at boats and how you're going to utilize the space. There might be some features of a boat that are like, you know, really cool, but they might not be practical. It might not be an area that you're realistically going to use. We have 400 square feet, but I think all of the spaces are spaces that we use. And we like how the boat feels like there's a lot of separation. We like the raised pilot house versus having our salon and our galley and pilot house sort of all on one level. That raised pilot house allows some separation so that Elizabeth can work in the pilot house and I can work in the salon or we can, you know, exchange with each other if we get bored of our scenery in the areas that we're working at, but at least we're, we don't feel like we're right on top of each other. So we like, like having kind of the different spaces that this boat offers, but, you know, make sure that you give the layout a good hard look and think about how you're gonna utilize that layout if you purchase a boat and choose to move aboard it. Yeah, and the two staterooms and two heads. Yeah. Huge, especially, not only, you know, we're just a couple with a dog. If you had a kid, you would obviously need two staterooms, but having that extra space, um, in our guest stateroom, we have a desk. So I can go close the door and be completely silent and you know feel like I have my own space. But it also allows us to have friends and family aboard. And I think for a lot of people moving on a boat, it would be a little sad and depressing if you knew you didn't have space for anybody. So that's come in really handy. We've had um, some friends come aboard, uh, other couples, and we've had so much room. Like they've had a comfortable, um, experience on board we haven't really heard that they're even on board and it's made a big difference to not feel like you're living in a cave or you're living in a place that isn't um, comfortable to have friends and family so that second stateroom in the pilot house are critical yeah another suggestion is go paperless uh, you know being in a small space 
paperless saves a lot of space, but also allows you to do things uh, remotely. You don't need to, uh, again, be connected to a physical address where you can receive mail and you know send out your bills and mail. Just try to do switch everything that you can to be electronic so you can access it online. It's gonna save paperwork on your boat. It's gonna save the need for uh, you know, going to banks and having access to mail. Also, try to, you know, digitize things that are in paper form that you have. So, scan documents that are important to you. Um, if you have a bunch of pictures and sort of family albums, if you can transfer those to be in a digital format, not have those in the boat, you don't have to risk um, those memories, I guess, getting ruined. They're always with you in digital form, and again, they're not taking up the space. So, as much as you can, go paperless and go electronic. Yeah, and I think just a couple other final pieces of advice that you may not think about, but I think have been for me and for, for both of us really important is to one, stay really healthy and stay active. It's easy when you're on a boat, especially for us where we cruise for long periods of time, um, 12, 16 hours sometimes, um, it's easy to stay sedentary um, and to stay in your little space, but get out, get get out in nature, hike, move your body a lot. And there's a lot of small spaces on this boat. You know, when Sean's in the engine room crawling around and I'm helping him out and I'm crawling around, if your back is in bad shape or if, if you're just not in good shape, it's gonna be harder to maintain things and to lift your big heavy fenders and to dock the boat. And you know, this is a really heavy boat and a lot of times I'm pulling in and you know, just keep your body in really good healthy shape. Also, you don't really realize it. I didn't realize it um, at first, but um, get yourself a really good hat and sunnies because you are out in the elements all the time on a boat. Whether you think you are or you're not, here it's pretty gray a lot of the year, but it's there's still light. And we have a lot of light on this boat and we're always wearing our sunglasses and a hat for a reason. Keep your sunscreen handy, get a good hat and get a good sun, get a good pair of sunglasses when you live aboard your boat to keep yourself and your skin and your eyes and everything healthy. First up. Our first question this week comes from Catherine Bailey. And Catherine Bailey is nine years old and lives in the UK. Nine, that's awesome. Yeah, that's way cool. Catherine asked, um, how did you get Mr. Sully used to being on the boat? That's a great question. So Mr. Sully is a rescue dog. We got him when he was about four years old. Um, we don't believe that he ever spent any time on the water until he met us. I think what got him acclimated quickly was that we had his sister Sandy. Sandy was able to show him the ropes. He could kind of follow her lead. And I think that that was super helpful in getting him prepared for the boat. We got him a life jacket and we've taken him to the beach and kind of gradually introduced him to the water and to swimming. And I would say he's a good boating dog. Yeah, speaking of him, where is he? Maybe he'll, oh, what? He's down there, isn't he? No, I think he's no, up there. No. Is that uh, our first question from a nine-year-old? It, I think it is. Thank you for your question, Catherine. Catherine, you, you're our youngest Q&A. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, second question comes from Frank, and Frank lives in Phoenix. Is it healthy for a dog to live aboard a boat? Also, when you dock, does it take time for your legs to function on land? <laughs> so, interesting question. I definitely think it's healthy for a dog to live on a boat. And in our experience, it's actually pro probably made th made Sully and Sandy um, healthier dogs because they're so much more active. Taking them out requires more walking here. We have a long dock to walk down. Um, they're always out and about and we're just out and about a lot. Um, so I think compared to our apartment life where we could just go up the elevator to a dog patch, go right back down. Most days where they weren't as active, I definitely think being on a boat is healthy for them. And I like to think, you know, when we go explore different areas, it makes them happy. <laughs> and then when we dock, I don't have sea legs. Do you have sea legs? No, I've never, would, I'd say I never noticed. Yeah, I sea legs. never noticed. Even on our really long trips this summer, um, I think all I've really noticed is when you've been sitting for a long time and you stand up and every bone and muscle in your body is tight. That's all I notice. Um, but yeah, thank you, Frank, for that question. Our third question comes from Mike and Amanda, and Mike and Amanda live in Seattle, so they're local. Cool. Laundry mat, and then the onboard went, oh. Should I read it for you? No. <laughs> <laughs> How do you like your all-in-one washer and dryer in the pilot house? Do you use it for all of your laundry, or do you use the marina laundry mat, and then use the onboard when underway or at anchor? 
We actually installed the all-in-one washer dryer on our boat. It didn't come on the boat when we purchased it. And I would say uh, it's one of the top two or three things that we've done to the boat. Probably for me, number one. Probably number one. It actually works extremely well. We wash everything in it. And by everything, I mean like we put our bedding in there, our bed sheets, we'll put um, our duvet cover for our comforter and it fits in there and washes up well. Yeah. Um, it really does work well. The Splendid combo units have gotten a bad rap for two reasons. There's two versions. There's a, a, a non-vented and a vented dryer. I would get the vented one. I think the non-vented ones take forever to dry your clothes. And even if you have a vented one, you need to keep up on, there's a, a maintenance cycle that you need to run on the machine like once a month to make sure that lint doesn't get trapped up in the uh, vented line. So. Provided you get a vented model and you follow that sequence, it works extremely well. The clothes do come out a little bit wrinklier than, um, say, the, a, a separate washer dryer like you'd have in your house, but we've found some ways to improve um, that situation as well and make the clothes less wrinkly, and that's to short cycle the dry, don't let the clothes get fully dry, and then pull them out and sort of shake them out and flatten them and then put them back into the dryer and finish the dry cycle. And that'll help minimize the amount of wrinkles that you get in the clothes. It, it really works. works. extremely well. When he first did it, I thought he was crazy. I was like, what are you doing? Like you're folding our wet laundry, <laughs> but it, it made a big difference. Yeah. yeah. And if you guys have been watching our channel, you know that Sean loves to iron, so. I, well, I used to iron the bed sheets because when I put bed sheets <laughs> in the washer dryer, they oh, would yeah. come out so wrinkly. And now I, I follow that where I pull them out wet yeah. and I actually completely fold them and I put them into the dryer folded and then finish the dry and I don't have to iron them anymore. And so it, it, yeah, it really works. Makes a huge difference. Yeah. So thanks, Mike and Amanda. Our fourth question comes from Andrew in New Zealand. Did you fear or worry about leaving house slash property ownership? Will this prevent you from owning a house in the future or is boat life what you prefer for the foreseeable future? So I guess the first thing is yes, boat life is what we prefer. And honestly, at this point, I can't ever see us going back to land life. I love houses and I kind of have a hobby of like looking on Redfin and looking at houses that are for sale. I've just been like that for years. And even though I love houses and I love looking at real estate, the fact that we can just go anywhere and take our house and move it if we need to is such a great feeling. So I can't see us going back to living on land anytime soon, like ever. It, yeah, I think it's obvious, you know, people say home property appreciates and a boat is a depreciating asset for us, but you know, I, that's not what it's all about. For us, it's about, you know, creating experiences in our life and it's, you know, yeah, Maybe we'd have some more money in equity or in our savings account if we lived on land versus lived on the water. But for us, this is a, a choice that we make to invest in experiences and not in property. Yeah, and we've had three properties. We've owned three condos, which have all helped us get this boat, especially our last condo here in Seattle. So I think I feel like we've been there, done that with home ownership, um, and now it's nice to be free and you know, be able to travel the world and not worry about that. So very good and very interesting question, Andrew. Next, uh, Jim from Salt Lake City uh, asked, how can I convince yeah. my wife to buy a Nordhaven? Well, hopefully this video helps with that. I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I guess the only thing I have to add, because this is a really tough question, um, I'll just tell you quick, try to tell you quickly a little bit about our story because it was a little bit like Sean. He he for a long time had to work to convince me that a Nordhaven was worth it. Um, we were primarily looking at American tugs and Celine trawlers. And I really was in love with Celine's. Um, there was a 43 foot model and a 47 foot model that I had my eye on, mostly because the interiors were just really beautiful and a, they felt a little more spacious. Um, and just, it had a little more, uh, it was a little more aesthetically pleasing than a Nordhaven. You know, Nordhavens are great boats, um, but they're very ship-like. And at least, it, you know, our boat compared to some of the Celines that we looked at, didn't have some of like the, the fluffy bells and whistles inside. And the price of those that we were looking at was quite a bit less than this boat. So me being the person that I am, I just couldn't justify, like, why would we, why would we go for a Nordhaven? And Sean, always kept reminding me and I kept reminding myself that if we want to travel extensively and cross oceans and do it safely 
with the security knowing that we are in one of the top rated vessels in the world for safety and security and comfort of that type of long range cruising, really our only option was a Nordhaven. There's a lot of redundancy on this boat, so we have a backup engine. Um, we have a lot of backup systems that made me feel more comfortable. So the closer we got to making the decision and the more I thought about long term, I just knew if we didn't buy a Nordhaven, we'd always regret it. Um, I prefer safety and comfort, and that's what we have in a Nordhaven. So. Also, you know, if you're trying to convince your wife, get on a lot of Nordhavens. They're great boats. If you can see Nordhavens that are for sale in your area, I think the more you see them and experience the, the interior and the, the layout, um, it's easier to convince somebody that if you're looking, than if you're looking online. So Jim, I, I hope I did you some service there. <laughs> <laughs> Next question comes from Kevin in England. How do you feel about living on board Freedom with the dark nights looming when most of us are planning to lift our boats for winter? Such a great question, and that is the number one reason we moved out to Seattle from Wisconsin. We went through such a dark depression every October 30th, around like the 30th of yeah. October. It was such a terrible, depressing time. It was winter, it was cold, dark, and we had to say goodbye to the boat. So we were done with that. We wanted to boat year round, and just in general, um, speaking for myself, you know, that transition from summer into fall, especially as you get closer to the longest day of the year, is a depressing time for me. Um, and now living on the boat, I don't feel that depression. I am happy most days because you're, you're out, you're on the water, you're on your boat. Honestly, for me, it feels like a vacation every day. I don't, I don't feel that dark depression that comes in when the days get really dark and you know, gloomy. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you have seasonal affective disorder, living on a boat could be a really good thing for you. Next question is from Barus, Barus, Beerus, 81, from the Netherlands, one of those. Uh, the question is, how did you two meet? So simple answer is it was a friend of a friend situation. Um, when I was going to college, the, I was living in an apartment and my roommate, um, who was, was someone that I was going to school with and also working with at the time. Uh, he, had a, he had a girlfriend and she would come over to the house once in a while and I basically said, don't you have any girlfriends that you can hook me up with? I was single at the time and um, Elizabeth happened to be <laughs> my roommate's uh, girlfriend's, one of her good friends. So I was the girl. <laughs> she, she, she was the chosen girl to come over and be introduced to me. And the rest is history. Yeah, that was uh, how long ago? 18 uh, years ago, yeah. 18 and a half years ago, wow. And one of our first dates was jet skiing. Yeah. John had jet skis and uh, actually no, our first date, we went to the Port Washington Marina in Wisconsin and walked around after dinner and we saw boats with lamps in them, <laughs> like little trawler boats with lamps. And I was like, look at that boat, it's got a lamp. Like they're sleeping on their boat tonight or something. And we got so excited and we said, wouldn't that be cozy to have your own boat with a lamp? And we've had four of our own boats, but we've never had a lamp. We've never had a lamp. So maybe the next boat will get a lamp. Maybe a leg lamp right here for Christmas. We're probably gonna need a bigger <laughs> boat for a lamp. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you guys for all those questions. We really appreciate it. And thank you all for watching this video. We hope you found it helpful and informative in some way. And as always, if you have more questions for us about living on a boat or our boat or boating or anything like that, um, feel free to find us on Instagram, drop us a line, tell us your name, where you're from, and we will answer your question in a future video. Sounds good. And if you didn't like this style of video, we'll come back next week. We'll likely be cruising somewhere or doing some work on the boat or have different content for you. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you next weekend.